guys. Hope we're not interrupting your lunch hour for this, but uh, we're going to talk about ethylene oxide sterilization, in particular a, a process that's called batch release testing. And uh, what this is, it's uh, a, a process that you're able to release a lot of product or a small batch of product without going through a full validation. So it's very useful for animal studies or clinical trials, things like that, or for companies that produce very small volumes of product. Uh, but to start out with, we want to go over a little bit of a review of ethylene oxide for those that aren't as familiar with it. Ethylene oxide sterilization, when ethylene oxide is a gas. It's a gas that they use to sterilize products. It's colorless and odorless. It's odorless at, at uh, lower concentrations, but when you get up to very high concentrations, around 430 or, or above, it does have a slight smell of ether, an ether-like smell. It's uh, a gas at room temperature, so the sterilizers take the gas from a liquid uh, pressurized tank and they run it through a vaporizer just to make sure that, that it does completely convert to a gas so you're not adding liquid ethylene oxide into the chamber. Um, it, it does have some safety concerns with it. Um, not only is it toxic and uh, mutagenic, which is um, bad for people working with it, but it's good for its use as a sterilant. It's very effective at sterilizing microorganisms, but it's also flammable and explosive. And so there's got to be a lot of safety um, processes in place when working with it because of the explosion danger of it. If you look at ethylene oxide, there's a lot of it that's produced every year. It's around 52 billion pounds of ethylene oxide are produced every year, but only a small percentage of that is used for sterilization. Only about 1% of EO produced is used for sterilization. 99% of it is used for other industrial chemicals. Because ethylene oxide is so reactive, it's, it always reacts with other things to make other compounds. So about 70% of that they use to make antifreeze uh, with ethylene glycol. They use it to de-ice planes, things like that. They also use a lot for detergents, brake fluids, and, and so on. About 50% of the market industrially is used for ethylene oxide. You have about 50% with radiation, 50% with ethylene oxide. Uh, very little on a large scale is done with steam or other things like vaporized hydrogen peroxide. So really it's split between EO and radiation. Uh, what makes it such a good sterilant is it's so reactive. It's, it has an epoxide ring that always wants to open up and react with other chemicals. That's why it's used mainly as an industrial chemical to make other things. But because it's so reactive, it reacts with the uh, cellular constituents of the, of the organism. It reacts with nucleic acids and its DNA and causes damage. And that's the, the mode of, of operation of how it kills the microorganisms. So it disrupts proteins and things like that. It's uh, considered an alkylation reaction as opposed to oxidation. Things like hydrogen peroxide would be oxidation, ethylene oxide's an alkylation. So that's basically uh, some general information about ethylene oxide. Um, it is one of the most complex types of sterilization. Uh, when you look at something like radiation, you only have one variable, you have dose, and that's all you have to worry about. But with ethylene oxide, you have all of these variables that, that have to work in conjunction with each other. You have temperature, relative humidity, gas concentration, and then exposure time. So you have to do a lot of monitoring with these cycles. You have to have temperature and humidity probes in the load. You have to monitor the pressure. So you have to keep all of these um, different variables in check within the predetermined limits. So it's a little harder to do something like parametric release with ethylene oxide because of all these variables that have to work in conjunction with each other. Uh, temperature is probably one of the most critical. Uh, they have what's called the Q10 effect. For every 10 degrees Celsius that you raise the temperature, you're going to double the inactivation rate of the microorganism. So it's going to kill that much faster. So the higher the temperature you can do with ethylene oxide, the better it's going to sterilize. Uh, most sterilize, uh, contract sterilization cycles are usually anywhere from 45 to 55 degrees Celsius. You rarely see anything go above 55 degrees, uh, which is about 130 degrees Fahrenheit. So typically that's the range you're going to be in. So it's really, it's real niche is for what they consider low temperature sterilization for a lot of the plastics and components that either would melt if they steam sterilized it, or if you use radiation, there might be some kind of issues with the polymers that it can't go through radiation. With relative humidity, it's another critical factor. Um, basically, with relative humidity, you just have to have a minimum amount to allow that alkylation reaction to take place. Generally, anywhere from 30 to 80 percent relative humidity is what you see with most cycles. Um, gas concentration, that's exactly what it sounds. It's how much gas is put into the chamber. And this is typically termed in terms of milligrams per liter. 
So they measure that, you know, how much milligrams of gas per liter of chamber space. And normally you'll see a range of anywhere from 400 to 600 milligrams per liter. Um, and then exposure time, exactly that. That's just how long it sits in the chamber at pressure, and that's where the sterilization is taking place. And this really depends on both the, how hard the product is by itself or the product load put together. And that generally varies anywhere from two to 10 hours of exposure time for, a, for most common cycles. So batch release was a method that was developed because a lot of customers had the need to come up with a small amount of product that they needed for either an animal study or a clinical trial, but they didn't have the, either the money or the number of samples is usually the limiting factor to go through a complete validation. So they just need a few, you know, maybe 20 or 30 samples. So they needed to find a way to sterilize it where you can prove that it's sterile, um, and, but then have product that you can use for, for whatever purpose. And so in the past, they used to basically take product to a local hospital, ask them to run it through with just whatever stuff they had, but there was really no way to prove that that product really got sterilized without going through some of the testing. So what this product does, this is basically in essence a mini validation that allows you to do it with a very limited number of samples and uh, not a lot of time. If you look at a regular full ethylene oxide validation, it could take anywhere from one to three months to do. It's gonna be you know, roughly around $20,000 possibly with all the testing and the samples that are required for it. So it's a pretty intense um, process. You know, I mentioned that EO and radiation are basically split 50-50. The cost-wise, they both come out about the same in the long run, but ethylene oxide is more expensive up front because of this initial validation. So to be able to come up with product without going through this was, was a real challenge. And this is what this uh, process uh, was developed for. So really, again, what it is, it's just releasing a small batch of product uh, without going through the full validation. In order to do that, you have to, you have to have samples that go through a half cycle, which is what you use with ethylene oxide sterilization to prove the sterility assurance level you're going to get. You run them through a half cycle to prove that, but then the product that you're going to use on patients or sell has to go through a complete un uninterrupted cycle. And so you can't just add another half to that first half cycle and call it a full cycle. You have to go through the half followed by a full cycle. So actually the product's going to go through one and a half times. So it's really just a two cycle process that you go through. But this will allow you to go through and prove the sterility assurance level. Um, every batch stands on its own merit. So if you were to do this two times consecutively, you did one batch and it worked fine and you released that product, but then you did a second batch and it failed, that does not call the first batch into question, which is the nice thing about this, because you're not validating a process, you're validating each batch by itself. You're proving that each batch is sterile, that the residuals are below the limits, uh, you know what the bio burden levels are, you know that there's no problems with the bio burden resistance, so every batch stands alone. Um, it is found in the standard. Amy TIR 16 has a section in there that talks about this. Um, so it, it is something that's been done for years and years, but now it's been placed into the standard. And you can actually do this batch release process on basically any type of sterilization. Now with radiation, it's a different type of process. You don't go through the overkill process like you do with these others. So they have a different method to do this, but you can do this with steam, you can do it with dry heat. Um, anything that does the half cycle concept makes it very easy to do. So it can be done, uh, mostly it's done with ethylene oxide and that's what we're concentrating on today. So if you look at this chart, uh, when you look at the line for biological indicators, in, when you're using ethylene oxide, it's, it's what's called an overkill concept. You're basically taking one million spores, or 10 to the sixth, and you're putting those spores in the hardest part of that device to sterilize, and you're gonna kill that in half the time. And so you can see the amount of overkill that could be built into these cycles. Your actual product may only have bio burden that has less than 10 organisms or less than 100 organisms, but you're putting one million highly resistant spores in the hardest part of that product and you're killing it in half the time. So your routine cycle is gonna double that. So you can see the amount of overkill that you have built into it. If you look at the, the graph of the product bio burden, you know, in this example here, the bio burden may be around 50 organisms and that's it. But uh, you're, you're basically monitoring it with a cycle that's gonna be several orders of magnitude longer than it needs to be. So it's important to understand that overkill concept when you're looking at this batch release process. And, uh, in order to get the, the six log reduction, you start with a BI that has 10 to the six spores on there. And so that's gonna be important too, which we'll go into in just a second. So when you look at anything that you claim sterile, 
has to be sterile to what they call a sterility assurance level of 10 to the minus 6. Basically what that is, is it's one unit in a million being non-sterile. It's the same thing as a, a 12 log reduction. That's what's the requirement for all terminally sterilized devices are is that it, it has to be go through a sterility assurance level of 10 to the minus 6. So this 12 log reduction is going to be important when we look at, at this batch release process because when you show a half cycle, because you started with 10 to the 6 spores and you show complete kill, that's going to give you a 6 log reduction there. So you're halfway to that sterility assurance level. But if you remember, you, all, you have to go through a complete uninterrupted cycle. So you're going to also tack on a full cycle, which is going to give you twice that amount of kill. Ethylene oxide is considered to be first order kinetics, so the line that you get of lethality is going to be a straight line. So in the second half of the cycle, you're going to get the same amount of kill that you would have got in the first half of the cycle. And so that presumption that you're going to get that same amount of kill gives you that 12 log reduction in your full cycle. So when you look at doing these batch release cycles where you go through a half and a full, then you're looking at an 18 log reduction because you get 6 from the half cycle and then 12 from the full cycle. So the requirement is 12, but this is a very conservative process and you're, you're going to end up with something that's going to be either 18 to a 23 log reduction. So very, very conservative, lots of safety factor built into it. That's a why, why you're allowed to release product from this type of process from a cycle that's not yet been fully validated because it has so much overkill built into it. So there's a lot of different testing that goes into it. A lot of this is going to be the same as, as you would for a routine validation. Because you have to use spores or spore strips or spore sutures, something that has one million of those spores and you've got to put those in the product so you actually inoculate some of the actual devices and you have to do a, what they call population verification, which is going to tell you, do we have 10 to the 6 spores on, these, on this challenge that we're doing? Because you have to be able to prove that you started with 10 to the 6 in order to prove the sterility assurance level. So this is done up front. Uh, basically, it's taking the spore strips or the sutures, grinding them up, macerating them so that you get all the spores into solution, and then you dilute those out, and then you're able to uh, back calculate so you can find out exactly how many to start with, because you want to make sure, one, that the BIs are alive, and two, that they have high enough population. So that's the first test that they do. Second one is bio burden enumeration. What this test does is basically tells you how many organisms are on the product after it's gone through all the manufacturing processes, up to but not including sterilization. So this is really when you say your product's sterile, that's what it means. It means you're killing whatever bio burden happened to be on the device from people touching the device, handling it, uh, from the air, you're going to have organisms settle out and, and land on the product. Your raw materials are going to have bio burden on those. So it's important to know what your biological challenge is prior to sterilization. So this test is going to do a minimum of three samples where you can just determine what that is because that's something that you're going to have to do. BI sterility, this is where you're going to prove your sterility assurance level. This is where you're going to inoculate the, the device in the hardest areas with these, these spores that are 10 to the 6 population. So after the, you're going to run a half cycle, you're going to pull those half cycle samples out, you're going to test those. This test is really just a plus or minus. They put these strips into these tubes of microbiological media and it either grows or it doesn't grow. So you're looking for complete kill of no growth on that. Then you're going to put new samples in for your full cycle, so you start with fresh samples there. So you have the half and the full cycle that's going to have the biological indicators in there. Bio burden resistance. When you do the bio burden enumeration test that we talked about first, that only tells you one thing. It just tells you how many organisms are on the device. It doesn't tell you what they are, and more importantly, it doesn't tell you how resistant they are. The resistance is going to be the critical factor because you have to prove that there's nothing on this device that's more resistant from the spore strips. And so once in a while, you can have a device, an organism that can mutate, can change, and become more resistant than those spores. The spores are where you're proving the sterility assurance level, but you also have to prove that there's nothing on your actual product that's going to be more resistant than that. So this is basically the same thing. It's going to be a plus or minus test. They're going to take the device, cut it up, put it in media, and incubate it for a minimum of 14 days. And again, they're looking just for plus positive growth or no growth. So it's just a visual test where they look for turbidity and, and changes in the media. 10 samples is the number that's recommended for that. Again, since you have to test one million of your product to prove the sterility assurance level, 
whether you use 10 samples, 100 samples, or six samples, the number here is not as critical. You're proving your sterility assurance level from those one million spores on those spore strips. This is just a judge of the resistance of the bio burden. So again, you're gonna have residual testing that's gonna be done after these because the product goes through both a half cycle followed by a full cycle. It's gonna go through both of those, the product that you're gonna actually use on the patient. So you have to make sure that the residuals, because ethylene oxide and ethylene chlorhydrin are toxic materials, you have to make sure that these residual levels fall below the, the limits that are outlined in ISO 10993-7. That's the residual standard. And these limits have just gone down from what they used to be. So it's important to know that when you're gonna use these, whether it's for a clinical trial or for a small lot that you're gonna sell, you wanna make sure that they're below the limits. So you're gonna test some samples there, usually one to three units. We also recommend that you take an additional sample and freeze it just in case if you test it after sterilization, you're gonna test it after the aeration phase. But if the levels are too high, you're gonna to have to pull samples and retest it. And so it's good to have a sample in reserve just in case that the first test comes out above the lim ISO limits, that you have a sample that you don't have to then take from one of your units you were planning for your clinical trials and waste it for additional samples. So it's good to have one up front to just hold in reserve and you only test that if you need it. So that's the residual testing. LAL testing, again, this is not really necessarily part of ethylene oxide sterilization or validations, but it is a test that's required if your product requires it. And it's normally done for products that have direct circulatory contact, you know, it's something that's gonna go into an artery or a vein, or cerebral spinal fluid contact. So if any of those have that, then you have to do the LAL testing as part of that lot. It's a, it's a lot release type test. And so uh, some products, or in some cases, you won't have to do this. So um, it just depends on if you claim that your product is that. So, yeah, you have a question? I'm sorry? Oh, okay, that's a good question. LAL stands for Limulus Amoebocyte Lysate Test. It's really just a test that's done from, they use the blood of a horseshoe, horseshoe crab, and they're looking for endotoxin that's coming off the product. Certain gram-negative bacteria have, will have this endotoxin on there. So you're looking only for gram-negative bacteria, and these, these, uh, this material on there will cause a fever in the patient. And the problem with, with endotoxin is even if you sterilize the devices and you kill those organisms, that material that's on their cell wall is still physically present, so you're still gonna have a problem with endotoxin even if the device is sterile. So you can do this testing whether it's before sterilization or after sterilization. So as you can see, all this testing you do is just like you would do with a regular validation. Um, you would do all the same testing, it's just done on a reduced frequency. You're gonna do a lot lower sample volumes and you're gonna do it all on just this one batch alone and then you're able to, uh, to prove that. This is outlined in, in the standard, Amy TIR 16, uh, which was republished back in 2009. They revised it and added, added some new, uh, you know, they usually revise these standards about every five years. And 2009 it has this section 5.5, which specifically talks about batch release testing. And it, as you see, it doesn't tell you exactly what to do, but you basically are gonna follow through everything just like a routine sterilization validation. Uh, we do this testing here at Nelson Laboratories. We have several different ethylene oxide sterilizers. If you have product on a larger scale that won't fit in our sterilizers, you can also do this, this uh, at a contract sterilizer. Or if you do sterilization in-house, you can do it there as well. You just have to do, do the half cycle followed by the full cycle and do all the different testing that's re, re, um, required on that. And then once you do that, you're able to release that batch. So that's basically it for batch release. Uh, Looks like we're about out of time, so if there's any other questions, uh, I'll just be right here in the back and we can go over this more if you'd like. But uh, there's some information on the back table, if you want to grab some of that on Nelson Laboratories on ethylene oxide sterilization. Again, we do this in-house, but we also assist a lot of people that are doing this at contract sterilizers. For themselves, we have standard protocols, pricing, and so on. So thank you for your time.